Hello everyone, my name is Primitiva, and in the world of Pokemon, there are lots and lots of ways for Pokemon to grow up and change into new forms. And what we call this is evolution. And evolution in the Pokemon games happens in a lot of ways, with the simplest one being leveling up. But there's also lots and lots of other ways of evolving Pokemon, and that is what this video will be about. Theorizing how every evolutionary method works in the wild, where there are no trainers around. The easiest to explain is also the most common method of evolution. This is when a Pokemon levels up, it reaches a certain level, and it, well, it evolves. This is basically a Pokemon's experience, hence why it's called experience points. So if a Pokemon has enough experience with survival, it will evolve. It doesn't necessarily have to do with age. When a Pokemon is just sitting around all its life doing nothing, it won't evolve. Like if you just have a Trico in your party throughout the whole playthrough of Pokemon Sapphire, for instance, and it doesn't really gain any experience points, well, it'll be a Trico at the end of the game as well. Then there are evolutionary stones. If you're a trainer, you can simply just buy these stones or find them in nature, and you can use them to evolve the Pokemon just like that. But for Pokemon that actually live in the wild, it doesn't work as simple as that. Evolutionary stones aren't common in the wild, because they're a rare occurrence of hyper-focused infinity energy that's based on the environment. Leaf stones, for example, are made up of energy that only exists within the forests, jungles, and such. Pokemon that evolve through this stone, like Weeping Bell, evolve in the wild because they are constantly exposed to this energy. So when a Weeping Bell is with a trainer, well, I doubt you're just gonna leave it in the forest until it evolves. So you'll need to get a Leaf Stone. Now, of course, a Weeping Bell could also just at random find a Leaf Stone somewhere and then instantly evolve, but that's very uncommon. And all the other evolutionary stones also have that same energy in them. Fire stones are naturally created within hot places. So around volcanoes, hot spring, and well, basically anywhere where it's hot. Water stones are formed around any body of water, although I think that they are often formed deep underwater, by the pressure of the water combined with infinity energy. Thunderstones are formed in special magnetic fields, you know, the places where previously Magneton, Nosepass, and Chargebug could evolve. That's why thunderstones work on them now. It always did, however, people just didn't think it would and never considered to use them up until now. However, these stones are also formed when electricity strikes which also releases a massive amount of electric infinity energy around the area that typically looms there for a while. Ice stones are formed in cold places, and anytime it snows. Pretty simple. Moon stones are formed from the energy from the moon. Every night, moon infinity energy fills the air, but it isn't a whole lot unless it's a full moon. Then the energy is plentiful everywhere. Sunstones are formed from sun infinity energy, which gets created during the day and is affected by sunlight. This explains why mostly plant-based Pokemon evolve from this stone. When the day ends and night begins, in between that time, dusk stones are created, but also in dark places like caves, so it's basically darkness infinity energy. Contrary to those, we also have shiny stones, which form in very bright places, like the sky or any other place where the light is powerful. And finally, you have dawn stones, which are created during the morning, as the sun begins to rise and begin to form in little morning sunspots. Now, finally moving on to the others, we have a lot of Pokemon that evolve through friendship. In order to do this, you need to raise their happiness. In the wild, well, that's practically the same. A Pokemon just needs to be happy, and then it evolves. Easy. But then, there are also Pokemon that need happiness to evolve, but also during a specific time of the day, like Umbreon, which evolves from Eevee, but only at night. That happens because these Pokemon are biologically programmed to do so, their genes activate when set under these conditions. There are also Pokemon that need to learn a specific move before evolving, like Ancient Powder, with Piloswine, Tangela, and Yanma. This happens because as soon as the Pokemon knows the move, something in its genes activate, telling the body that it's ready for adulthood and for the next stage. Pokemon that evolve when they're only a certain gender is also the same. They're just biologically programmed to do so, like Curlia going into Gallade. Although, I do find it weird that Gallade is a male-only Pokemon, considering that we do have both female and male Gardevoir. With a Pokemon like Frostlass, it's a bit more understandable, considering its inspiration. 
But with Gala, it's like, it's a knight, okay? There have been lots of female knights in history, so I don't really get it. Trade evolutions with items are similar to evolutionary stones. Onyx, for example, feeds on soil underground, and it's said to evolve at the Steelix when it has lived a hundred years. But honestly, I think it just needs to eat soil for that long, because that soil contains metal. So when you use a metal coat, which seems to be purely made out of metal, the evolution activates instantly. Honestly, this method of evolution is not really that complicated. If a scyther evolves into scissor with a metal coat, well then in the wild it just needs to gather up all those materials over time. And even with something like dust cloths, which evolves with a reaper cloth, who's to say that they just don't knit these? That's pretty cute to imagine, actually. The only exception is the Porygon line, which seems like it can only evolve through human means. I mean, it is created by humans, so that makes sense. There are some places where you can find Porygon in the wild, but not Porygon 2 or Z, which only solidifies this theory. Regular trade evolutions, though, they are very tricky, like Haunter into Gengar, Kadabra into Alakazam, and so forth. And what I thought of is, well, if you trade a Pokemon, it's like an act of trust. Right? You believe that the other person won't just steal your Pokemon. And heck, if they do, well, you trusted them and you believe them. So maybe the way that these Pokemon evolve in the wild has to do with them trusting themselves, or maybe gaining the trust of someone else, or heck, maybe even misusing the trust of someone else. What if in the wild, these Pokemon need to just believe in themselves? trust in themselves. Believing in yourself can, after all, be seen as a sign of adulthood. You know, you're mentally stable, and you know that you can do this. Sure, you can just beat up some Pokemon here and there, gain some experience, but believing in yourself and trusting who you are? That's harder to do. And yeah, that's all I got. This one was honestly the hardest to do. Uh, what would you all have done? Finally, there's Shelmet and Carablast. If you trade them at the same time, both evolve. How does that work in the wild? Well, they're often just found together in the same place, so they just meet up and evolve. Easy peasy. Next up, we have non-regional form Pokemon evolving into regional forms. Like when a regular Pikachu evolves into an Alolan Raichu. How does that work? Shouldn't the Pikachu then also be a regional variant? Well, perhaps the later evolutions of these Pokemon is all that's needed. So this regular Pikachu in Alola still isn't the same as any other regular Pika. This one has genes that are activated through the region's special energy, likely Infinity. And then we also have some really weird and specific evolutions, like Inkay into Malamar. Inkay evolves if you reach a certain level, and you turn your console upside down. That's weird. How would it even do that in the wild? Well, probably once it masters the move Topsy Turv, which you know, turns you up and down. Plus, I don't find it hard to believe that this Pokemon couldn't just turn upside down, so probably something like that. Tyrogue evolves depending on its stats. So in nature, these would just be genes activating, determined by which experiences it goes through. Wormpole is a weird one. This Pokemon's evolutions are somehow determined by its personality values. So in nature, that's just simply genetics. And these genetics will determine whether it'll evolve into a Pewtifly or a Dustox. Left behind exoskeletons are weird. So how would a Pokemon like Shininja even appear in the wild? Well, it's Ninkata's exoskeleton possessed by infinity energy. And only happens when a Ninkata evolves, but when there's no one around. So it's rare. You know how you need an extra Pokeball and also an empty spot in your party for Ninkata to evolve into Sheninja as well? Well, that's because it needs the space there, just like it does in nature. Another weird but easily explainable evolution is Pancham. It evolves at level 32, but only if you have a dark type in your party. In the wild, this likely means that a Pancham must have had contact with a dark type directly for a long time, maybe became friends with one, and through that, it knows its own hidden dark potential and evolves. From the same generation, there's Sligu, which evolves at level 50, when there's rain or fog in the overworld. So it just needs to reach that level and just have some luck, really. Lastly, from Gen 6, there is Sylveon, which is definitely an odd one when it comes to evolving. First of all, it needs to get a lot of affection from Pokemon and me and the likes. So how do you even begin to make that work in the wild? Wild Eevee evolve into Sylveon because of love. They need to find someone else who they can share these feelings with. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be romantic. 
It just needs to be very affectionate. Something that is beyond normal friendship. Oh, and it also needs to learn a fairy type move, of course. So, an Eevee just needs to get all lovey-dovey and fairy-like to activate one of those countless hidden genes that it has hidden inside that cute little fluffy body. Two weird ones from Gen 4 are Mantike and Burmy. The first evolving when there's a Remoraid in your party. So, in the wild, it needs to successfully form a symbiosis with this Pokémon. So, it'll stay under its wing and boom, evolution. Burmy evolving into Wormadam is heavily influenced by its environment and genes. Genes because it's a female-only evolution, and environment because, well, which one it's in triggers the evolution. Although, perhaps it's possible that all Wormadam just look the same underneath, and that their typing is affected by whatever they grab nearby and put on. And now it's time to end this video with the unique evolutions of Gen 8, starting with Galarian Farfetch'd. This Pokémon can only evolve into Surfetch'd as soon as it does three critical hits in one battle. In the wild, this is probably the same, but it means that this Farfetch'd is really good at its skills. It's really good at battling, and only the best can evolve into a Surfetch'd. Next up is Galarian Yamask, which is probably the weirdest method of evolution in Gen 8. Heck, no, perhaps the entire franchise. In order for this one to evolve, you need to go under the Stone Bridge in Dusty Bowl in the wild area and take at least 49 damage without healing. That's just really weird when you read it out like that. I think that in the wild, these Pokémon evolve through something like this. It's probably, I don't know, a ritual of some sorts, where these Pokémon have to prove to themselves that they can sacrifice some of their own life energy without dying, and then they evolve through the use of a ritual, like maybe some sacred item or something, sacred place. Not necessarily the stone bridge though, or maybe it is just a stone bridge. Maybe you, maybe the Galarian Yamas just do go to that place and they do that thing and they evolve. I don't know, I just like to theorize. A not so weird one is Applin. It needs to either eat a tart apple or sweet apple to evolve into Flapple or Appleton respectively. Just simple genetics again, really. Eat one of those and something in the body, well, activates. Milkery is odd. It evolves into Alcremie depending on which sweet it finds. Then you have to spin around until you strike a pose, and depending for how long you spin, which direction you spin, and even which time of day it is, it will determine the color and flavor of the Pokémon. These sweets are likely just made from berries or fruit a wild Milkery can find, so it just needs to hold that close to it at all times. Milkery might have also developed certain social groups, where they all evolve at the same time by spinning and dancing at certain times. And you mimic this when you have one in the ball. Or maybe it just finds the sweet and somehow merges with it. Like when you have it equip it in the ball and you spin around, you know, you're kind of acting like a blender as messed up as that sounds. And how long you blend and how long you spin, how long you do the whole thing will determine the flavor and color of the Pokémon. Yeah, this one's kind of odd, but I like both possibilities. There is one Pokémon that I forgot to mention, though, and that is Meltan. In order to evolve Meltan into Melmetal, you need to have 400 Meltan candies and give it to it. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have Pokémon Go and I've never really been that bothered with it, but how does something like this happen in the wild? Well, that's actually confirmed in its Shield Dex entry, where it states that these Pokémon live in groups, and when the time is right, the strongest Meltan will absorb the others. Wait, does it just, does, does it kill them? It, it, it absorbs them, right? Does it kill them or do they all just live together as a hive mind? You're like, oh, what even, that's, that's messed up. What happens? But yeah, Melmetal, yay! And well, that's it. Those are all the main methods of evolution in the mainline Pokemon games. This was fun to do. Anyway, what did you all think of the video? What are your ideas on these weird Pokemon evolutions? Let me know in the comment section down below. In case you're feeling generous, I have a Patreon, which is in the description down below. It's only one buck a month and it really helps me with this channel, so go check it out if you want. As always, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more. I got lots of cool stuff on the channel and I always got more coming soon. And with that being said, I hope you all have a good day, night or morning, and as always, take care!